Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Welcome everyone to Williams. Um, if you're visiting this morning, do me a favor. Look at the end of your pews and you should see a little sheet of paper. It has a couple of questions. They're really easy questions. Um, we would love for you to fill them out and put it in the offering plate. And that way, we'll have a record of your visit. Um, so everyone, grab onto those bulletins, open them up, and look on with me. There is an announcement that's not in the bulletin. And Stacy, she's going to come up here and make that announcement. So come on up here, beautiful. Good morning, everyone. This week, um, we had a um, little tragedy in our community. Um, I don't, some of you may know the Cangelosi family. Um, they have a senior at the high school, Brittany, and uh, an eighth grader, Emily. They're both real involved in cheerleading and um, sports at the school. And um, one night this week, they came home around 10 from the Heflin basketball game and found that their father had, was, has passed away. So they found him. And um, that's kind of touched my heart um, a little bit. And I'm really trying to find a way that we can help them out as a community. I don't believe he had life insurance. I don't know that they have a way to bury him. Um, and so I've decided to, I'm gonna have a, a community-wide yard sale at my place. Got plenty of parking and um, lots of room. So if anybody in the church would like to help me with that, that would be wonderful. Um, either by coming and donating your time, maybe some of the youth can come, um, or just you know bringing a, a table, a tarp, put your name on it, and um, we can kind of set all that up, or if anybody has some things they want to bring and set it up that day. It's going to be December the 4th, it's a Friday, and the 5th. So we'll do kind of early in the morning, maybe around 7 both days. And on Saturday, we'll try to end around noon, um, depending on how much success we have. And then if anybody wants to come back and get their items that didn't sell, or um, if not, just leave it and we'll get like Hannah Home or whatever, um, organization to come pick it all up around three o'clock so um, again that's Friday the 4th of December and we'll start you know around seven or so I'm gonna need some help that day to set stuff up I think um, but um, I've had a few volunteers and so for sure on Saturday I know the kids will be in school that day but if on Saturday if anybody from the youth or anyone wants to come help me on Saturday morning until about lunchtime or whatever whatever you can give me whatever you can help me so we'll give all the proceeds of that to um, that family to help them with their funeral expenses. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stacy. All right, um, if you have your bulletins open, then you notice there's some stuff going on here at Williams like normal. Um, you can make sure that you come back tonight at six o'clock. Uh, we will have Deacon ordination service for Miss Sharhonda Duncan. Sharhonda Duncan. Um, I always have a nickname for someone. Um, but that will be at 6 o'clock, so make sure you come back and we'll be meeting in here. Um, I need to meet with my parents and youth really fast after the service to go over some details about Six Flags, okay? Um, missions committee meeting will be after the service this morning, right behind me in the choir room, not loft, choir room. Um, and there's a list of people who is uh, on that committee, so please make your way after the service to the choir room. And also there will be a baby dedication service right after their service here. Um, and it will be for the Griffin and Green family. And if you're wondering, who's that? Chris Green. Chris, hey, hey, Chris. He used, he used to be one of my fellow youth, you know, growing up with him. Um, but it's also the great-great-grandson of Doyle and Danola. So y'all are all invited to come after the service. Um, there is uh, some information you need to know about Christmas and JCOC Toyland. We're going to be helping um, a lot of the Pleasant Valley families that we've helped in the past through the JCOC. So if you would like to sponsor a child, we're not gonna do families, it's gonna be done differently. If you would like to help out a child, then you need to see Regina Hunts. She has the paperwork for you and a list. And if you don't wanna sponsor a child and just wanna give um, a check, you can and make it out to JCOC Toyland. Make sure you include Toyland. Um, but Regina will be in the gym. They're practicing right now for uh, their event coming up in a few weeks. But see her after the service this morning and, and get that information from her. And then also we have our Wednesday nights activities going on. Supper is at 530. And if you notice, it's turkey and dressing night. 
we will be celebrating Thanksgiving this Wednesday. So make sure you're on the list to eat because it will be delish. And then at 6.30, it'll be Bible study with the adults and kids and you, okay? So I've done enough talking. Hopefully, I have read over all that you need to know about, and there's more, so just read on. All right, so now it's time for you to find someone to love on this morning, someone you haven't hugged your, their neck or kissed their cheek or shook their hand. Do it now. Go. Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning. Uh, also, another announcement this morning. Uh, congratulations to our cross-country team for, I know, uh, the girls won state and the guys came in fourth. That's a good, they run a lot more than I ever will in my entire life. So, thank and congratulations to those guys. This morning, as we have uh, not only lit the candle to remind us of Christ's presence here, we also light it this morning to remind ourselves of the tragedy that struck that I know you all know about not only in Paris uh, but in Beirut, Lebanon and in other places around the world. And so this morning as we uh, have our time of invocation I'm going to ask for just a moment of silence uh, maybe for you to pray to yourself a time just to think about those who we have lost in this tragedy and just to pray for, for peace to pray for the coming of our Lord Jesus that these sorts of things may soon be over. So let us join together in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, our friend and our Savior. Lord, this morning as we have gathered for worship, God, we gather knowing that there are those this morning who are without loved ones. We gather knowing that there are those in this world who have been taken by acts of violence and terror. And Lord, we pray, God, for our world. We pray for our world this morning and we pray for peace. And Lord, we pray for ways that you may show us that we can be agents of that peace. And may you give us the power and strength to do so. So Lord, as we are gathered here for worship, as we have come into this place this morning, help us to feel your Holy Spirit and your presence here with us. Remind us, Lord, of the great privilege we have of worship and of service to you and your kingdom. And Lord, give us the power of your Holy Spirit, to not just simply sit by and shake our heads. But give us the power, Lord, to do what you call us to do, to change this world for the better, to bring your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. So, Lord, be with us this morning as we worship. May it be what we are here for this morning. Help us, Lord, to lay aside all other things on our hearts and minds, to put aside whatever anger, whatever frustration, whatever, whatever may be on our hearts distracting us from you this morning. Help us to lay it aside, that we may worship, and that we may hear your Holy Spirit speak to us, that we may respond. In the holy name of Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Pray.
Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out, or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of light, in your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. <coughs> Good morning again. I invite you to take your hymnal this morning and turn to 555. We're marching design. We'll sing the first, second, and four stanzas. Let's stand as we sing. Now, would you turn over to 551? Soon and very soon, we'll sing uh, first, second, and third. First, second, and third.
clean this out a little bit. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Oh, I can hear. Oh, hey, I can hear y'all now. Okay. Y'all doing okay? Yes. Are y'all ready for a game? Yes. Oh, I know. We should just play a game at church. Let's do it. Okay, we're going to play a game this morning, and it's called, it's a Japanese game. And I know you've played it before. You have? Yeah, he has. It's called Hana, 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 Kochi. Y'all played it, right? Yeah. Yeah? Well, it's a little bit of follow the leader and a little bit of Simon Says. Hana in Japanese means nose. And Kochi means mouth. So, Hana, 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 Kochi. It's nose, 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 mouth. Okay, so here's, here's how you play. You're going to do exactly what I do, but I'm going to trick you, okay? Because I'm good at that. So you're going to try not to be tricked, all right? So what I'm going to do is tap and say nose three times. Nose, nose, nose. And then I'm going to say another part of me, but I'm going to touch the opposite side. It's you I did it. And make sure that you hear that last word that I say, and you point to that spot of you, okay? So, for example... No, snow, snow's mouth. Where did I point? Ear. I pointed to my ear, but y'all are going to point to your mouth. That's what I said. I said mouth. So that's where I trick you. So don't, don't, don't try to be tricked. But I'm pretty good at it. Okay? You ready? All right, here we go. Let me get ready. Let the tricking begin. All right. No, snow, snow's cheek. You're supposed to do it with me. Do it with me, okay? We'll, we'll try again. Ready? One, two, three. Nose, 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 foot. Oh, I tricked all of you. But you're supposed to touch your foot. Y'all touch your feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get it now? Okay, let's try again. All right. Ready? One, two, three. Nose, 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 elbow. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was okay. Tell, I told you I'm good at tricking. I All know, right. I just... All right, let's do it one more time. Let's see if y'all can get it. Okay. Okay? Nose, 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 belly. Belly? <laughs> oh. Oh, I just tricked you. Oh, you just tricked me? I think you did. You little trickster. Well, it's fun in a game to be tricked because it kind of challenges you to do better. But when we get tricked in real life, that's not fun. It's kind of hurtful, yeah, isn't it? Bad. Yeah, it's bad. Well, in the Bible in Mark, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he was telling them, there's going to be things that happen that might scare you. And you may hear people talking about things that are going to make you worry. But Jesus says, don't panic. Don't be afraid. Don't worry. Because Jesus knew that if we as Christians spend all of our time worrying and scared of everything and what may happen, then we're being tricked. Because that's not the purpose of a Christian. We as Christians have so much more we should be doing than being afraid and scared and worrying. Because God wants us right here and right now to be busy, busy loving each other, even those that are so hard to love. Helping those that need help, feeding those that are hungry, visiting those that may be sick or just sad and alone, visiting those that may be in prison. So we have a lot that we can be doing instead of worrying and being afraid. Because when we just live that kind of life, we miss out on a lot of love that God wants us to experience. So I know and believe with your help and with everyone else's help, if we can be busy, loving and caring for each other and being more compassionate, we can make this place, our home, close to heaven on earth. What about if somebody kills us? I'm well, I'm we'll just have to children. deal with it, I guess. I don't know. I that's a, that's a question you need to ask <sighs> Pastor Chris. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys for coming down. Today's my birthday. Oh, and today's your birthday, Coco. Oh. And y'all are going to go with Miss Courtney. Uh, so let's go.
Thank you for that good word, Nikki. It was good. Uh, our offertory hymn this morning is uh, 350, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Let's sing first, second, and fourth. Stand as we sing. Let us pray, please. Lord, we come to you today thanking you for this day that you have given us, a day to gather here in your name. And we thank you for all the people who are gathered here. Lord, we thank you for this church that you have given us to worship in. We know, Lord, that all good things come from you, and we thank you so much for all the blessings that you give us every day. Now we come to a time when we give a portion of those blessings back to you. And as we make our offerings, may we do so with glad hearts to support this church and the work that it does. Father, most of all, we thank you for your Son and our Lord, and it is his, in his name that we pray. Amen.
Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the 13th chapter of Mark's Gospel. I'll be reading from Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 8 this morning. Mark chapter 13, beginning with verse 1. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. And Jesus asked him, You see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. Would you pray with me? Now, Lord Jesus Christ... We pray that we hear your words, while mine are quickly removed from the way. That we will hear your words that challenge us, words that encourage us, words that shape us more and more into your likeness. May we hear those words, Lord, and we take them to our heart. May they change us. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Friday night, in a series of coordinated attacks, terrorists, reportedly a part of a group referred to as ISIS, killed 129 people and injured hundreds of others across the city of Paris, France. What you might not know is that same evening there were back-to-back earthquakes that shook off the coast of Japan. The first was a seven-magnitude earthquake followed about 90 seconds later by an earthquake with a magnitude of 6.5. There were tsunami warnings given to the coastal cities of Japan. But the night before, in Beirut, Lebanon, 43 people were killed and 239 were wounded by a suicide bomber. That didn't make as much news as the Paris attacks. In the Middle East, the Syrian civil war rages on, a conflict that began with the Arab Spring of 2011 and has given birth to terrorist groups like ISIS or ISIL, And this war is also one of the leading causes of the European migrant crisis that has forced thousands of people every week to seek asylum in countries across Europe. There have been countless other wars, battles, and conflicts that have ravaged people groups across the globe in recent years. Some have made the news, many have not. Like the civil war that took place in Sudan for 22 years, from 1983 to 2005, that left 2 million Hear me, two million people dead as a result of the fighting, the famine that ensued, and the disease that came with it. And at least four million people were displaced from their homes at least once, most of them more than twice. And in Gaza, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict continues, a struggle that has been ongoing since 1948. Are these signs of the end times? There have been enormous natural disasters in recent years, like the tsunami of 2004 that struck in the Indian Ocean that killed hundreds of thousands of people. There was Hurricane Katrina in 2005, the earthquake that devastated Port-au-Prince and most of Haiti in 2010, the tornadoes that ripped through this part of the country in 2011, Superstorm Sandy in 2012, and the many other hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires, and even a landslide as recent as this week in China. Eruptions and storms 
that have caused enormous damage and taken so many lives all over the world. And this year we've even seen a record drought out in California, causing local governments to limit water usage and local citizens, especially those whose lives are tied up in agriculture, to pray for a solution to an end to such a threatening lack of rain. Are these signs of the end? Then there are those other naturally occurring phenomenon that have taken place in recent years, events with names like Supermoon or Blood Moon or Super Blood Moon, which sounds like a really bad sequel. <coughs> They're comments that, make, comets that make appearances once a generation or so, constellations and planets that just happen to line up with other constellations and other planets in the night sky. Are these signs that the end is near? Then there are all those things that have happened that cause unrest and discomfort for so many. Those social political happenings that cause some folks to pray that the end would just come on. Things like the issuing of social security numbers, barcodes on chewing gum and candy bars, rock and roll music, rap music, boy band music, Justin Bieber, <laughs> the Great Recession. The legalization of same-sex marriage, marijuana, gambling, and heaven forbid, liquor sales on Sunday and playing football on the Lord's Day are all of these signs of the end of the age, too. What is it? What is it about us that makes us so fixated on all things eschatological? That's a fancy word that means the end time. Why is it that so many of us seem to devote all of our religious energy on things that are supposed to point us towards the end of days? we got to say it like that too, right? Nobody says, end of days. They say, end of days. It seems to me that so many people are so infatuated with talking about and looking for the end times that they think that they're honestly the first people to ever do it. They actually think that they're the first ones to ever say, I've got it figured out. Because every generation, there have been those so-called preachers who stand in their pulpit and shout, I know when it's going to happen. The Lord will return in my lifetime. And you know what's happened to every one of them so far? They wound up dead. Really, though, why are we so enamored by the end? It isn't something new, something that's just come along in the last century or so. In fact, it seems from this passage before us, from the text in Mark's gospel before us this morning, that right from the beginning, I mean right from the very beginning, when Jesus himself even hints at things concerning the end, what happens? The disciples go, hey, hang on a minute, Jesus, what would you say? Tell us a little bit more about that. You know, they don't do that. When he says stuff like, you got to take up your cross and follow me. Oh, yeah, whatever. They don't say, oh, what, is that? what does that look like, Jesus? When he starts to say, you see all these buildings? They're going to come down. Ooh, when's that going to be, Jesus? Tell us more. As they left the temple, you can tell the disciples are caught up in its grandeur. I mean, this is Herod's temple. There's polished marble, glittering gold. And it's not some tiny little building with a steeple sticking up. This is a huge building. They're so overcome by this complex that they say to Jesus, Teacher, what large stones and what large buildings? This isn't a small undertaking of a few hundred thousand dollars. This is a complex, a mega building. They sound like children who take their first trip to the hospital and ride the elevator for the first time. Ooh, I've never been on something this high before. They're, they're overcome by it. The temple at that time truly was a sight to behold. They said that you could see it glittering on the horizon on a clear day from miles away. And for the Jews who worshipped there, the temple was a wonderful testimony to the God they served and the religion to which they belonged. So these disciples, good Jews that they were, they marveled at this magnificent structure, a building that looked as if it would stand forever like the temple, like the pyramids in Egypt. A building that would stand there in the center of that holy city forever. But then Jesus says to them almost casually as they're strolling out to sit opposite on the Mount of Olives. You see these buildings? Not one stone will be left on another. 
all will be thrown down. Not, yeah, some cracks are going to happen here, some of it's going to fall. There won't even be a rock, not a stone left on another one. That's a pretty big statement to make. It's one that comes true, by the way, around the year 70 when Rome ransacks the place. But this is in the day before easily controlled explosives, before cranes equipped with wrecking balls. So to say, you see, this structure, not a single bit of it's going to be left standing. That's an enormous thing to say. To say it will be raised to the ground without a single stone stacked upon another one, that's crazy talk. Especially when one considers that this is the house of Yahweh, the house of God. But the disciples, the disciples don't really seem all that surprised by this prediction from Jesus. After all, the temple had been destroyed once before some five or six centuries by the Babylonians. So the practicality of the temple's destruction was not beyond their imagination. But what does interest them, you notice, is when is all of this going to take place? Tell us, they say, when will this be? What will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? When's this going to happen, Jesus? We want to know. We want to know so we can be prepared. So we can put it on our calendars on the refrigerator, set reminders on our smartphones, cancel our Netflix subscriptions, have our bags packed, our guns loaded, and our swords sharpened. When is it going to happen, Jesus? What should we look for? How are we going to know? That's what the disciples ask. And if we're honest, that's what so many of us ask. When's it going to happen? What should we be looking for? And Jesus responds, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am. And they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. Man, right off the bat, before Jesus gives the signs, he gives a warning. Don't let anyone fool you. Because a lot of them are going to come and say, I'm him. And they'll fool a lot of folks. I think another way to hear that is Jesus says, look, there are going to be a lot of people who come and say, I've got it all figured out. I know when it's going to happen and what it's going to look like. I know what it's going to be like. And they're going to fool a lot of people. I suppose that's why I'm more than just a little hesitant when I hear somebody say, I know when it's going to happen. I know what it's going to look like. Or when they say, I can predict every little thing that's going to happen leading up to it. What events will take place? Who's going to be involved? What it's going to look like? Because I often wonder to myself, how much time and energy have they spent trying to pinpoint a day in the future when there are so many things Christ is calling us to do in the present? Now, after his warning, Jesus gives them a list of signs, doesn't he? Wars and rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes, famine. All of those things sound awful and terrible. But friends, they're things that have happened as long as there have been two human beings who figured out how to pick up a stick and hit each other with it. All of these things are awful and terrible. Wars and the terrible conflict they bring, the violence, the bloodshed, death, and destruction, even if the result of war is compromise, liberation, or justice, the price that is paid is always a high one. When nations and kingdoms rise up against each other, it is rarely for the sake of justice, but far too often for the sake of financial gain or the pursuit of imperial conquest. And anyone, anyone who's watched the news in recent years ought to know the devastation that can be caused by an earthquake and the heartbreaking images of famine. But these are all given as signs from Jesus, signs of what to expect, signs of what will lead up to the end, right? That's what he says, isn't it? So when we see these things, does that mean that the end is upon us, that the end is at hand? Does it mean we ought to brace ourselves for what's to come when we witness these signs? Should we stop what we're doing? and prepare ourselves for some terrible, destructive ending. 
Should we say, I've seen the signs, now let's look up at the sky and wait for Jesus to come back and carry us home? Or is there a whole lot more to it? Because you see, it's that last sentence in our text that ought to give us some guidance. Jesus gives them all of this, and then he says, this is but the beginning of the birth pain. These signs... These things you will witness, they're only the beginning. The beginning of that which will give birth to the kingdom of God in its fullness. The kingdom as he prays on earth as it is in heaven. But you see, that's the problem with only looking for the signs. We fail to be about the work we've actually been called to do now. The work of bringing God's kingdom to reality. Because sadly, too many Christians are like those first disciples in this text. They really only get excited about the end. So what happens when preachers say, oh, what would you like for us to talk about? Oh, preacher, I want to hear about revelations. That's how they say it. I want to hear about the end, preacher. Let's talk about that. They're only interested in how things will go down once the signs they've been told to look for take place. And too many Christians seem to have a vested interest in watching the world get worse rather than striving to make it better, as Jesus has actually called us to do. It seems that there are even a number of believers who are betting all their chips on the end happening in their lifetime. And so they disregard the health of our planet. They cast off the importance of providing long-term solutions to present problems. And they ignore those who are most vulnerable in our world. Those who are victims of injustice, victims of violence and hatred. I've even had them say to me, well, the end is coming soon. They won't have to suffer too long. Doesn't sound like something Jesus would say. Jesus has not called us to be sign seekers. Christ has not died just so that we only look forward to the end. The Lord calls us to be people who live every day knowing that today might not just be the end for us all, but today is definitely the end for somebody. He calls us to act as if somebody's end is going to come if we don't act. Christ calls us to be people, yeah, we look for signs, but not in the way we think. We look for signs of destruction, signs of oppression, signs of evil, signs of sin now, not so that we can predict what's coming, but so we may act to get rid of those signs in this world today so that we may be agents of God's coming kingdom. Or to borrow Jesus' image, if this is but the beginning of the birth pangs, then Christ has called us to act as midwives, helping to ease the birth pangs until the kingdom is born into wholeness and into completion into this world. Because whatever it looks like, Whatever that day looks like and whenever it does come, whether it's after church, whether it's after lunch, whether it's a thousand years from now, whether it is in my lifetime or not, if I'm not dead and in the ground, I don't want to be caught looking up at the sky. I don't want to be caught saying, I got it figured out. I want to be caught doing what Christ has called me to do. I want to be caught making somebody's life better today than it was yesterday. I want to be caught saying the good news with my mouth and with my hands and feet, not simply planted on the sky or on the ground, looking to the horizon, saying, come and take me, Jesus, let me, take, let me go home. I want to be caught doing what Christ has called me to do now, right now. So let us all be doing that. For Christ has not called us to be sign seekers. Christ has called us to be kingdom bringers on earth now as it is in heaven. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, as you call us here in the midst of such news we hear, it seems too often. News of devastation and war and destruction. God, remind us that we are not called to simply take them in and chalk them up as signs. 
that you have called us to be your hands and feet here and now. Lord, that the good news is the good news for the world. So you call us to be bringers of that good news, heralds of the good news, of the gospel. To know, Lord, that whatever end may come, it is not the final word. For you and your love have the final word. So, Lord, whether it be today or a thousand years from now, Lord, help us look forward to that day and not let it dominate our lives, our way of thinking. But, Lord, may your love dominate our lives. And may the actions you call us to do, or may we do them faithfully. And may we be caught doing them, if that day should be today. So, Holy Spirit, move among us now. Speak to our hearts. Have us, Lord, to do whatever it is you would have us to do this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Our invitation hymn this morning is uh, 327, Jesus is Calling. We'll sing the first and second stanzas. Please stand as we sing. As you go forth from this place, may you do what Christ has called you to do this day. And if you look forward to that day, may it be to urge you on in the things that he calls you to do now, in the present, in the midst of those with whom he has surrounded you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, go with us from this place. Guide our steps, Holy Spirit, that we may return back to this place. Having seen you in our lives this week, and renewed again to worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.